Welcome to the Brain Gain Youngstown Leadership Series Podcast. Each week, we'll learn from leaders who are driving change and making an impact. Now here's your host, the CEO of the Youngstown Publishing Company, Jeff Leo Herman. So welcome to the Brain Gain Youngstown Podcast. We are thrilled to be here at the Eastwood Event Center, and we're taking a special opportunity to interview two special guests. So we have Guy Coviello, CEO of the Youngstown Warren Regional Chamber, Good to be here, Jeff. Good to see you again. Thank you for having us here. Slade Gardner. Slade, thank you so much for being here. Looking forward to learning a lot from you about additive manufacturing and what you're going to be speaking about tomorrow. And I'm joined by journalist extraordinaire Dan O'Brien. Yeah. Can I use the word extraordinaire? Uh, nobody else has, so you're the first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, so the purpose today, as with uh, this is the Brain Gain Youngstown Leadership Podcast, and our focus is on building a culture of entrepreneurship and promoting workforce development. And tomorrow is the Chamber's annual meeting, right, Guy? Correct. And it should be, a, it's sold out. Sold out. That's amazing. Yep. Good that we're back in action in live event phase. People are anxious to get out and do something, finally. Yes. Exactly. So, Slade, you're the keynote tomorrow of the event. Honored to be the and keynote. So we want you to deliver everything you're going to say tomorrow right now. Roger that. <laughs> <laughs> and the good news is when this posts within the next week or two, uh, it'll been passed, so anything you say will be a summary for someone, a reminder, so actually feel free to share what you want. Fantastic. Right. So the goal today is to really understand how, first of all, why and then how we can really sustain our competitive advantage in additive. And so Guy, you and I chatted several weeks ago. The key takeaway, I've probably said it a dozen times since we talked. We have four sustainable competitive advantages here in the Mahoning Valley, of which they're logistics slash EV electric, additive, the military, and shale. That's the road according to Guy. Okay, okay, according to Guy. (laughs) So, and we we that's a strong lineup, right? That's a very strong lineup. Sustainable competitive advantages for us, and we're going to really zero in on additive today because Slade, you're here with us. So, Slade, before we jump into how we build upon our sustainable competitive advantage and additive. Just give us a little background about yourself. Give us the high level Slade perspective. There you go. Um, Well, I started my career, I got my PhD because I wanted to be an astronaut. And I knew that there were mission specialists on the shuttle. And I wanted to be a mission specialist. I wanted a career in technology and I wanted to go to space. Um, That led me into advanced materials. Advanced materials led me into an advanced manufacturing. And advanced manufacturing gave me opportunities to explore additive manufacturing. And I had opportunities very early when lots of people like to date. 3D printing's been around since the 80s, that's fine, but Additive manufacturing is an evolution of what we used to call rapid prototyping. And additive manufacturing really began its honest adoption in the very late 90s and early 2000s. And that's when I joined Skunk Works at Lockheed Martin in an advanced manufacturing group. And pioneered, developed, explored, invented ways of building aircraft. From there I went into spacecraft and then I went into business for myself. Absolutely. Well, that's great. I, you, we jumped right into your career, but as a child, you wanted to be an astronaut. Did, you know, we were dating ourselves, obviously, but you know, with space and a career as an astronaut, did you stare at the stars and say, I want to be up there someday? Or what, what, what inspired you to have that dream? You know, backpacking it inspired me in a very strange way. I enjoyed exploring places I hadn't been. I enjoyed setting up a campsite, an outpost. I enjoyed um, the feeling, that personal, that very personal feeling of standing on a fire tower in the Smoky Mountains and looking out just after a storm had passed. And just that feeling, I wanted uh, to capture that another way. And I really thought that being in space, I could capture that feeling. That was the emotional, driver for me so right. so jeff not to not to stray from where you're going i just wanted to point out before we forget 
um, there are two astronaut connections here. You know, Neil Armstrong took his first flight a couple miles from here right. as a child. And uh, Ron Paris was one of the most prolific astronauts at NASA. Went up, I think, twice to the space station, and he graduated from Harding High School here in Warren. Guy, that's two I mean, great local connections to his dream of being an astronaut. Yeah, people like that fascinate me. They really do. Do you think careers in in you know there's now a space force, careers in aeronautics, careers in space expo exploration? You have SpaceX, you have Blue Origin. Is that a viable career path that if I'm, say, in middle school, if I have a child in middle school and they want to get pointed in that direction, is that? I think it's a brilliant direction to head. For me, it was a passion that fueled my energy through PhD. And you need a little bit of extra energy to go the distance. You need a guiding star. And space travel, I never made it. Mm -hmm. I never made it for some very practical reasons, but um, it was a guiding star that brought me to where I am today. And where I am today is, in my mind, just as rewarding as an alternative path. Where, where did you get your education from? In, in... I went to undergraduate in eastern Pennsylvania at Lafayette College. Okay. My BS in, in chemical engineering there. And I immediately then went to Virginia Tech at the time, Virginia Tech was one of the top five PhD programs in polymer science. And uh, that's what I wanted at that moment. I wanted uh, an advanced degree in high performance polymer synthetic materials, more specifically composite materials. And Virginia Tech had a National Science Foundation Science and Technology Center for high performance composite materials at the time. Boy, that was where I needed to be. And um, it was a fantastic education. It was a blend of strong academics, uh, industrial collaboration, lots of presentations, lots of community events. It was such a cross-functional campus. And while my PhD was in chemical engineering, advisors on my committee and um, uh, colleagues in my workspace were in chemistry, engineering, science and mechanics, mechanical engineering, even electrical engineering, so I could branch out into the other disciplines. That is one of the things that attracts me to additive manufacturing. Every discipline is in it. Every discipline. It's math, it's chemistry, it's computers, it's programming, it's design, it's CAD. And then, now that I'm on the business side of it, it's marketing. It's communication. It's educating a customer base about things they don't know. They don't know they need a new design philosophy because they don't know that the new design philosophy compounds their investment on the additive manufacturing. And so every discipline is involved in additive. And for me, I'm hooked, right? For me, that's true uh, that's the discipline I want to invest my workforce development in because we need people of all backgrounds, education, skills, and capabilities right now mm -hmm. because this additive market is growing so fast. Well, so the legacy of our region is in steel, right? And I hear composite materials. These are materials that are combined that are not your organic, right, iron, coal. So are you saying that do you see our area embracing building upon additive and, and with composite materials being a driver within that is basically the, our, our answer to, you know, the legacy, the past legacy of steel? Well, it's complicated because People are using all materials for additive manufacturing right now. Some people are even additive using steel or metals and polymers and composites. People are using additive manufacturing to create tissue, yeah. organs, fascinating things. There's this revolution that we're living through and it's astounding because you don't know you're living through a revolution until you have a historical look back. 
But the combination right now of design computation and then converting information into a digital format that can be presented to some motion control instrument, the 3D printer, the robot. You've just taken all of this digital information and you've coded it in a way for this instrument to create something. And people are using this capability in all sorts of different materials. Steel, aluminum, polymers, composites, mm -hmm. they're all viable for structures and components in manufacturing. And um, there's a great surge of all those materials right now. I don't have a favorite material for additive manufacturing. When I was at Skunk Works, um, I was actually recruited into a group at Skunk Works because my background was synthetic materials. My first job was at Amico Carbon Fibers. I was an R&D engineer making new carbon fiber for new um, DOD applications. And then I went to Lockheed Martin. And inside Lockheed Martin, I was recruited to work in a team called Skunk Works. It was a special team that their charter was, they didn't know it was additive manufacturing to begin with, because the president of the company um, created this small task force team. And his direction was beautiful. It was such a mark of leadership. He didn't tell them what to do. He told them what he wanted. He said, pour me an airplane. <laughs> yeah. Right. That makes you feel something. Right. That motivates you. You don't know exactly what it means. And so it engages your brain. And Project Lightspeed, the charter, was to pour an airplane. We had to figure that out. Now, a lot of what we ended up doing was additive manufacturing. We explored all ranges of options. Mm -hmm. But Lockheed Martin was right in the middle of the Joint Strike Fighter competition. Lockheed Martin had X-35. It was competing against the other X-plane. And so we were looking for competitive advantages. We were looking for ways of creating high performance structure in rapid reconfigurable ways. Where we ended up, really where we ended up, the thing that came out of that 12 years later was um, large scale titanium additive manufacturing for structures. But I was recruited into that team to 3D print a fighter jet out of nanotubes. What? Yeah, I'm not sure I understand what you just said. <laughs> well, it took me a year to figure it out. Yeah. And they gave me that year. They let me travel anywhere I needed to go, talk to anyone I needed to speak with, to understand. Now my background was carbon fiber. Carbon nanotubes were new to me. The chemistry, the allotropes, the morphology wasn't new, but the synthetic path to a nanotube, a carbon nanotube, was brand new to me. And in that one year, I invented several ways of making carbon nanotubes and then spent the next few years transitioning those inventions into an additive manufacturing framework. Um, tremendously rewarding. The technology, we reached the limits of physics and chemistry. And it did not pay out in a meaningful business manner. So we learned a lot from the point of chemistry, physics, producing carbon nanotubes. But we never built an airplane with it. Um, along the way, I had another idea. I said, well, carbon nanotubes are great, but what if we put the nanotubes in polymer and made composites. Well, how about where we ended up with, ended up was, let's just use conventional carbon fiber and polymers, compound them, 
and use additive manufacturing to build structure. But we weren't interested in desktop sized build envelopes. So I bought a couple of industrial robots and I met Chuck George who sold me the first extruder to go on a robot. And we began paving new ground. We started this large format polymer additive manufacturing capability and this was 2005, 2006 timeframe and um, it's an industry today. Yeah. Uh, and Chuck and I were the first to do that. That's when I met Chuck. Oh. And uh, I've known Chuck for the balance of my career at Lockheed Martin and then when I left Lockheed Martin and went into business, well, he was a good partner to have. Absolutely. <laughs> so what's your focus today? You're in business today. Could you explain about your company? Yeah, I am president of Big Metal Additive. We have a hybrid additive manufacturing process that's unique in the world. Our machines, both deposit metal and machine metal with five axis cutting capability. There's other manufacturing processes. There's other hybrid machines out there. But our hybrid machine is married with our own proprietary process where we actually machine every layer that we deposit. Turns out that's really important for quality, for dimensional tolerance, for uh, reducing residual stresses. And it also allows us to build geometries that other additive processes flat out can't build. So if you look at our LinkedIn page and see some of the things that we've produced, they look like dinosaur skeletons. They're just really complex. We don't use parasitic support materials. Lots of other additive processes, they use support. You mean binding agents? Is that what you mean by parasitic support materials? I mean, if you need to build something that's going off at an angle or sideways, okay. a lot of people will build a bridge underneath yeah. to support it right? and then build I see the saying. truss and then they'll somehow break away or machine this and throw it away. Well, you've just wasted all that material and time creating right. that support. We just build the structure. We have techniques that are enabled by the five axis deposition plus the five axis machining. So what has enabled additive manufacturing? to evolve to this point. I mean, as you said before, it began as rapid prototype, yeah. basic plastic um, prototypes that they were making. I, I think I saw my first one, oh, I don't know, in the 90s, somewhere like that. At, at Kent State Trumbull actually had one. It was a little prototype, and they were doing these kind of fun mock-ups and stuff like that of different parts. So between then and now, I mean, what, what has changed in terms of the technological revolution that has enabled you guys to do what you do? A good bit of it has been software. Um, a long time ago when people were making models, there were very limited ways of taking a CAD model, they called it slicing it, so that you can create that code that you would then feed into the computer and it would then build it slice by slice. Um, that, wasn't, that wasn't magic, but when those kinds of software capabilities became more widespread, the capability grew. There was also some protected IP um, that patented IP for 3D printing with plastics, with polymers that once the patent expired, you saw an explosion of very low cost desktop 3D printers. That's when it became popular. I used to travel in the early 2000s and you sit on an airplane, you strike up a conversation, someone says, what do you do? I do additive manufacturing. Nobody knew what I was talking about. It would take 30 minutes to explain to somebody what I did. And then around 2010, 2012, all these desktop 3D printers 
hit the scene. They were on the cover of Wired magazine. They started showing up on Amazon. Schools bought them. It became conversational. Now, when I stand, sit on an airplane and sit next to a eight-year-old, <laughs> they tell me what I do. Exactly. <laughs> right? Everybody knows it now. Everyone has an understanding. And the other thing that happened from my perspective, I was um, an R&D engineer at Lockheed Martin until I was a fellow. And even when I was a fellow, I would have a difficult time communicating to senior leadership about the impacts and benefits of additive manufacturing. After 2012, you didn't ever have those problems. In fact, senior management would come to the office with this brand new idea because they saw something on Nova <laughs> and they needed their workforce to engage in additive manufacturing. Well, it turns out you actually had 30 people working on that scattered throughout the company, but now we're enabled, right? And so a lot of it was behavior. It was the psychology of acceptance. Additive manufacturing is a lot like traditional composite manufacturing in the sense that you are creating your structure from raw matter material right there um, in the manufacturing environment. Most of our conventional manufacturing, you might join, you might weld, you might fasten things together, you might start with a billet or a forging and machine it down into a component, but additive manufacturing, you show up with your bag of materials and then you build your structure. That means you have to trust that what you've built is really going to work. And so that trust, another word for it is quality, but that trust is essential for people to be able to adopt, uh, to be able to use those parts. And trust is a funny thing. Uh, if you're an engineer and if you work for an aircraft company, you don't trust material because you want to. You only trust it if it has the paperwork, the heritage, the qualifications, the certifications, the process specifications, the, the machine specifications, the material specifications. You need this wheelbarrow full of data and then test, test again, test again, test in a new environment. You need this wheelbarrow full of data just to trust the thing if you're in, in, at an aircraft company. A lot of big words. Right. Big concepts, and, and yeah, people understand desktop printers, but there's this void, so you, you leap from there to all these big words and big phrases, and, and we need to fill that void. Breaking it down, you know, whether it's the three of us that aren't engineers, <laughs> or the 50 people tonight who aren't engineers, and the 300 people tomorrow who aren't engineers, and the thousands that are gonna watch this podcast, that we're trying to educate on what are we talking here, here about, talking about and what's the opportunity? And I mean, is it the Star Trek replicator that we're talking about? Is, you know, it, we're missing something in, in between. Yeah, and, bring, and bringing it here locally yeah. to the Mahoning Valley, what does it mean? What are we doing today and how can we build upon this leadership position we have? Or do we even have a leadership position today? I think we do. Or we, we hear about it a lot, right? But what's that mean to you? The leadership position, because yeah. America makes us here. It's not, it, it's satellite somewhere else, but the headquarters is here. So does that give us a, a foothold, a leadership position? What does that mean? Yeah, yeah what's it really How mean? do we take advantage That's of a it? Quite, we throw, like you said, we throw the term around a lot. Yeah. Oh, additive, great. Yeah, I've learned, I, I've been studying this topic for a while now. You've certainly been studying it a lot longer than I have. And I learned a ton, and I'm going to have to, when I listen to this, like hit, go back, hit the 30 second button a lot. And, and yeah, I don't yeah. want to do that. But digest. No, but this was, this is fantastic. So, yeah, go ahead, Slade, if you want to. I think there is a leadership position. And a lot of the reason America makes anchors that leadership position because everyone in your community knows what it is. And everyone in your community knows there's a resource. Well, right down the street. I'm going to disagree with that. Yeah? I think everybody in additive knows what it is. Right. <laughs> and others who should be in additive, and others who should even, and others who are in other industries that should be embracing it are not 
aware of what it is and what it means to us. I think that we need to educate this community about the opportunity. That's probably fair. I, um, I'm too close to mom's cooking. Yeah, that's right. That's it. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah. From my perspective, the world has changed because I sense much more acceptance of the, th the things that I do, but I don't know those hundreds of thousands of other people Yes. Who are also so, and so I look at yeah. chamber members in manufacturing who are about to face industry disruption and aren't aware of how additive can help them navigate through that. Yeah. And and so I'm trying to connect. Yeah. Well, at least your community has that resource it close does. by. It yeah. Does. We just need to figure out how do we take it. Yep. Right. Right. Yep. The Brain Gain is a collaborative effort, and we'd like to thank our headlining sponsors, including Farmers National Bank, Sweeney Chevrolet Buick GMC, the Mahoning Valley Manufacturers Coalition, and Southwoods Health. Also included are Eastern Gateway Community College, PNC Bank, the Moransky Companies, the Mahoning County Career and Technical Center, the Youngstown Business Incubator, Simon Roofing, the DeBartolo Corporation, Youngstown State University, and Junior Achievement of the Mahoning Valley. Slade, you mentioned that you're seeing more acceptance of additive manufacturing from your perspective. Yeah. What type, what type of business, for example, has transformed their whole model as a result of additive manufacturing maybe that you've done with say we've done it this way for so long but let's try it this way for a moment and what type of impact did that have i guess on maybe their output or their product or their just their you know their, their industry in general um i don't think we can use the past tense yet the transformed i think it's transforming um, there's still plenty of work to do. Aerospace has taken the lead. Um, they can afford the investment because the payoff is so great. There's a lot of investment required just to educate their entire workforce of how to, how to do it. Mm. I used to say, I still say it, it takes two years to really understand how 3D printing or additive manufacturing works. And people don't believe it. Why would it take two years? Well, because you have to grasp the concept. And then you have to figure out how to match it with an application. And then you have to figure out how to design for it. And then you actually have to learn how to design again. And then you have to learn that there's other design tools that can help you to look Design, design yet again. And the design becomes so much of a part of where it is. And the companies that are transforming their business with additive manufacturing have things that look alien-like, right? You're not printing sheet metal. You're making complex unitized structure. It looks like dinosaur bones. And um, people don't know, how, people weren't educated. There is no class in college that says, this is how you learn how to design dinosaur bones. There's a couple of universities right now that have programs in an additive manufacturing, and now they're starting that process of educating the workforce. But the whole transforming of industry, there's so many different ways to get benefit out of it. It's not just about lightweighting aircraft engine parts, right? Or reducing the number of part count in a fuel nozzle. That's a great application, but there's hundreds of other great applications. My favorite one lately is this, digital inventory. What happens if you have a piece of equipment, piece of industrial equipment, and some flanged fitting breaks? And that flanged fitting was kind of complicated. It was cast in the 60s, and the manufacturer had an inventory in a warehouse they manage that inventory. 
They manage the risk of that inventory, and now it's depleted. And the company that used to make that part isn't around anymore. Uh, what happens? Well, you can use additive manufacturing and make a replacement. You're going to have to wrap your head around the fact that it's not going to look the way that that part that was cast in the 60s is going, it looked. It's going to look different. Now, the truth of it is, and we've gone through this with different uh, OEMs, the truth of it is, we can make it look exactly the way that old part looked. It's going to cost about $100,000. But we can have the one that's designed for additive for you for about 1000 bucks, hmm. And you were buying it for 1200 so you're saving money, you're getting it faster, you no longer have to have an inventory, you no longer have to manage that inventory, you don't even have to insure your inventory because it's a digital inventory now. And when you need a replacement part, you place an order, the part's built, and it's shipped to the location. So that I think people can understand. Right. That helps break it down considerably. You said it takes two hour, or two years to learn it. Tomorrow morning I'm giving you 20 minutes to teach it, and tonight I'm giving you two minutes to teach it. <laughs> um, so I, I think it might help to, to leap ahead to where can we be with additive? And I've heard people say, you know, 3D printing skin for burn victims, 3D printing entire automobiles. Houses. Houses. Mm -hmm. I, think I, I did read that the other day. Yep. It was pretty good. Concrete yeah. printing. Concrete printing. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Extraordinary. There's lots of imaginative end uses. So I had this awesome career at Lockheed Martin. I was a three-term fellow. I built fighter jet parts and spacecraft parts. And then I got out and went into business for myself. One of the first things I bought for my home office was a desktop 3D printer. And I started making things with it. Whew. It's not as easy as it sounds, right? <laughs> and it's not that it's that difficult, but you have to bend your mind around to the way that this really works. And you have to absorb the challenges that are there. You're, some of the early things that I built, I built turn signals for my dirt bike. I've got a Husqvarna dirt bike. And the turn signals are these three and a half inch long stalks and you break them off, right? They snap off on trees or rocks. And so I built these really close fitting, designed them, bought little LEDs that go and matched it to the motorcycle plastic bodywork so they could snap fit. Whew, I probably made 35 of these things before I got it where I wanted it. I had no idea that iteration process was so involved. That was in education. Um, now, when I build things on the plastic desktop 3D printer, I build one, it's my practice, and then I go right to the final version. But I had to go through that learning process, and it's a very practical thing uh, just to get your mind wrapped around how does this work. I can go to Home Depot and spend 20 minutes in the hardware aisle, and I can build something in my mind. I have a very strong recollection of where all the hardware pieces are. I could probably even tell you what's in the drawers, right, at the Home Depot. I need a metric. Uh, I need an M8 uh, nut. I know where to find it. But, and so I can, I can do that because it's years of training, right? Mm -hmm. It's years of going to the uh, hardware store, imagining what's there, imagining how to build something for my yard out of super strut fasteners and some gate hardware, right? But 3D printing, you have to go through that whole process again. You have to imagine how material comes together, how you end up building a product, what it's gonna look like. And um, that's a very real reason why everyone should, if you're interested in additive manufacturing, you should buy a desktop 3D printer and you should try to make some things around your house. Um, and design it from the ground up. Because once you get past that, then you can start imagining additive manufacturing for practical purposes. Now when you go to someone and you say, I need to replace uh, a flanged 
casting and it's got an elbow bend, what's it really going to look like? Is it going to look like that cast part? Probably not. There's some considerations to additive manufacturing where you want it to look different so that it's more producible. And going through that process of building it out of polymer on a desktop printer makes a difference. So you talking about a small scale printing operation, but uh, you're involved with one of the largest 3D printers in the world, yeah. I understand it, right here in Youngstown, Ohio. Can yeah. you tell us about that? So Center Street Technologies uh, has a extremely large polymer composite hybrid additive manufacturing machine. Uh, the work table is 12 foot by 25 foot. The, the Z height, as we say in the industry, the Z height is eight foot. You can drive a truck, and we have. You can drive a truck inside this 3D printer. It's awesome. Um, it has a high throughput strong press extruder uh, that allows it to deposit material at very fast rates. Um, we built that machine several years ago. It's a first of its kind. Um, just the, the mass, the, the, the size envelope, and the capability of having hybrid additive and subtractive right there in one envelope. Um, Center Street Technologies is really ramping up right now. Uh, there's been uh, government contracts that are really bringing the operation into um, recognition around the DOD, ramping up in workforce, and bringing that kind of a capability, that kind of an industrial additive manufacturing capability uh, right here to Northeast Ohio. So how do we, how do we build upon and to Guy's point, additive is one of our four competitive advantages, sustainable competitive advantages in the Mahoning Valley. What challenge would you offer to our audience, how they can support this or get involved? Like, what, what's the call to action here? The call to action begins with mental gymnastics and it leads to communication. But the mental gymnastics is the next time you have a problem to solve, a product kind of problem to solve, imagine how you would solve that problem with additive manufacturing. Because likely there's a solution. Now, you have to sort out if that solution is economically viable. It not always is. But when it is, it's very well worth pursuing. But the exercise is to imagine how to create that product with additive manufacturing. And the follow-on to communication is, if you don't know the answer, ask someone. Because there's lots of people here in the community affiliated with America Makes and Youngstown State University that can help you understand what the answer might be. And from there, it's wide open. From there, maybe you have just reinvented a new way, a new material, a new method of additive manufacturing that fits your product segment. Maybe you're adopting capability that already exists. Maybe you're going down to Center Street Technologies and simply having your product produced on equipment that exists right now and you have your result the next week. But it's that curiosity of wanting to know, and then following through talking with people who may have been there before, of brainstorming and um, going through that mental exercise. We are gonna wrap it up here, right? So Slade, you've been very generous with your time. Guy, thanks so much for your time. Dan, thank you so much. But we learned a ton today. And so we have a challenge for our audience, right? To get out there, to ask questions, to collaborate. And we thank you for joining us on the podcast. So good luck tonight, tomorrow, and we'll hope to see you back here again real soon. 
Great. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for joining us on the podcast today, because together we're building a culture of entrepreneurship and promoting workforce development. So if you like what you heard, please share it with a friend and leave us a rating or review on your favorite podcast player. Your feedback is very important to us. We want to make the show better all the time. And if you would like to give me direct feedback, email me, please. My email is j. H-E-R-R-M-A-N-N at business-journal.com or you can find me on LinkedIn. And lastly, would love to thank the members of the Brain Gain Coalition. Those headline collaborators include Farmers National Bank, Sweeney Chevrolet Buick GMC, the Mahoney Valley Manufacturers Coalition, and Southwoods Health. And joining them are members of the coalition including Eastern Gateway Community College, PNC Bank, the Moransky Companies, MCCTC, the Mahoney County Career and Technical Center, the Youngstown Business Incubator, Simon Roofing, the DeBartolo Corporation, Youngstown State University, and Junior Achievement of Mahoney Valley. Without them, none of this would be possible. So thanks again for joining us today. And remember, together we are building a culture of entrepreneurship and promoting workforce development.